pretty busy place, huh? Did you know that one out of every five people on the planet lives in China? It's the most populous nation on Earth. Chinese culture has been shared by more human beings than any other in history. Here's China on the map. Not much bigger than the United States, but much older. In fact, China is one of the world's oldest continuing civilizations. The same people have been here for more than 7,000 years. I'm Arizona Smith. I'm an archaeologist by trade. And that means that ancient civilizations are my thing. Objects like this get me excited. He's one of my favorites, a little model of a clay warrior. The real ones are as big as I am. And there are hundreds of them found by farmers in a huge pit under their fields. What a discovery. It gave us a lot more information about China's first emperor, a man who gave his name to his country, Qin. Call it the ultimate jigsaw puzzle. For more than 20 years, Chinese archaeologists have been piecing together an entire army made of clay. Foot soldiers, cavalry, even chariots, buried since the 3rd century BC near the city of Xi'an in northern China. It didn't take archaeologists long to figure out that they'd stumbled onto one of the most incredible burial sites in history. Ancient writings describe the Emperor Qin's tomb as a palace for the afterlife. Precious jewels twinkled like stars from the ceiling. Hundreds of thousands of prisoners recreated the whole of China in the tomb. Its mountains, people, and cities. Rivers of mercury flowed through a three-dimensional map of the land. Meanwhile, other workmen were making the clay soldiers to guard Shin in the afterlife. Archaeologists think molds were used for some of the body parts, but real soldiers may have also posed for the sculptors. No two faces are alike. The hairstyles, the expressions, all were individually carved. Each soldier's uniform was brightly painted. Chin began building his tomb at the age of 13. When he died in 210 BC, his son decreed that the workmen who knew the secrets of the tomb be buried with the emperor. For thousands of years, the legions of clay soldiers have stood in formation, facing Qin's enemies to the east. The size of the army is awesome, but experts estimate that thousands of soldiers still lie buried in pits yet to be discovered. A secret no longer, the clay army is now one of China's greatest tourist attractions. Did you know that Chinese is probably the hardest written language to learn? It doesn't use an alphabet. Instead, there are thousands of different characters or picture symbols. You have to know 2,500 characters just to read a newspaper article. Makes English seem easy, doesn't it? Wow! The discovery of Qin's tomb was an exciting moment in archaeology, and it's still unfolding today. And speaking of unfolding, let me show you. Most of Chinese history has been divided into periods called dynasties, families who ruled for generations. Now, if we go back 
to the Shang Dynasty. We enter a world that archaeology uncovered not very long ago. We found incredible bronze vessels and figures from this period, but you'll hear more about that later. During the Zhou Dynasty, the king gave land to rich nobles in return for their service and loyalty. But guess what happened? Over time, some of these nobles got pretty ambitious, setting up their own little states. China became divided into many states, always fighting amongst themselves. The stage was set for a strong leader to emerge. Our friend Qin, you know, the guy with all the clay soldiers. Qin had plenty of real soldiers, too. What's more, he was a great leader. He conquered the other states, unifying China and becoming its first emperor. Qin only ruled for 15 years, but he transformed his nation. He changed the system of government, taking away power from the nobles. He made everyone use the same coins, weights, and measures, and written language throughout his vast empire. This was a guy who obviously liked to be in charge. And when fierce horsemen from the north started raiding Chinese villages, Qin decided he could control them too. What did he do? He built a wall and not just any wall. To Qin, the problem of controlling invaders was easy to solve. Hundreds of thousands of peasants served in his army. Why not make them build a wall? to protect the kingdom's northern border. So the great project began. Make it eight horses wide at the bottom, six horses wide at the top, and five men high, ordered the emperor. The work was brutal. Many men died and were buried in the wall, but life was cheap. Five slaves were worth one horse and a length of silk. For 17 years, the peasants labored, building a wall longer than any in history. Once it was completed, China's Great Wall stretched for 1,500 miles. The highway distance between New York and the middle of Kansas. It can even be seen from space. And it did succeed in keeping out invaders. The Mongols didn't threaten China again for more than a thousand years. But the Chinese themselves did venture out in search of trade. More than 2,000 years ago, the merchants established a famous path across the desert called the Silk Road. Camel caravans carried luxury goods like silk, jade, bronze, and porcelain all the way to the Mediterranean coast and then by boat to Imperial Rome. Long before the West even knew where China was, Chinese goods were prized in Europe. Believe it or not, this shell would have been worth a lot of money in ancient China. Before the Chinese had coins, they used shells, cloth, and even grain for money. But by the fourth century BC, trading was so important that different Chinese states decided to issue coins. They were usually cast in bronze in funny looking shapes. Sometimes they would have holes so you could string them together and put them on your belt. Pretty convenient. In China today, Everywhere you look, there are traces of the past.
but Americans don't have to go all the way to China to explore the country's ancient past. Because in Orlando, Florida, there's a place called Splendid China. A copy of a park in China, where the Chinese themselves go to learn about their past. The great Chinese philosopher Confucius, who lived in the 6th century BC, thought music was almost as necessary as food. These ancient instruments include a Chinese lute called a pipa, a young chin similar to a hammer dulcimer, and a 2,000-year-old fiddle called an erhu. The clothes of the imperial court were made of fine silk. In China, only the rich wore silk. Even the merchants were often forbidden to wear it. Red and yellow symbolized beauty and power. These costumes were designed for an emperor and his wife. To the ancient Chinese, calligraphy was the finest of the arts. The soft inks and delicate brushstrokes also create beautiful paintings. Block printing is another ancient art, dating from the Qin Dynasty. This artist is making an imperial seal. I'll bet you didn't know the Chinese invented the yo-yo way back between the fourth and third centuries BC. They were originally made of bamboo. The openings on the sides make the whistling sound. For more than 5,000 years, the biggest event in the Chinese calendar has been the New Year. Families get together and celebrate, often with firecrackers, another Chinese invention. For many years, China's earliest history remained a mystery. Oh, there were legends about a people called the Shang but many historians doubted they ever existed. Then, about 70 years ago, archaeologists began to dig near Anyang, a little town in northern China. What they've found has rewritten Chinese history. Digging near Anyang in the 1920s and 30s, archaeologists uncovered the ancient city of Yin, more than 3,000 years old. They found turtle shells and bones covered with writing, revealing the rich history of the Shang Dynasty. They also found tombs filled with beautiful bronze vessels. The development of bronze during this period is mysterious, but we do know that the Shang Chinese were among the first to discover how to make bronze by mixing copper and tin. Casting bronze was tricky. First, you heated the ore and then carried the hot liquid to molds. Workers had to pour it very quickly before it would set. The metal was so important to the people that this period of history is often called the Bronze Age. During the Shang Dynasty, the Chinese made bronzes many have called the most skillful ever created. They made beautiful vessels like these to use in ceremonies honoring their ancestors. The Chinese also made bronze wine vessels. 
cooking pots, tools, and arrowheads. New discoveries keep telling us more about the Shang Dynasty. These heads are truly unique. They were found more than 600 miles from Anyang, so archaeologists now know that the Shang Dynasty was more widespread than once thought. are famous for their bronze bells. A musician would strike the bells to play a tune. Listen. Each bell can make two different sounds. Noblemen would tune their bells to match the king's bells. Confucius said music was not meant to entertain its listeners, but to calm and purify the spirit. Hey, anybody home? You'd better get to work on your paper. I was just trying to imagine what life was like for kids in ancient China. I'm not sure you'd have liked it. Kids had to be polite and obedient all the time. If somebody older came into the room, you'd have to stand up until the older person sat down. My mom would have liked ancient China. <laughs> yeah, mine too. Hey, what else have you found out? Well, as in most ancient cultures, girls had a pretty rough time. They married young and moved in with their husband's family. That doesn't sound like much fun. What about life for boys? Well, unlike girls, boys went to school. And if you were smart, you could go to college. China had an imperial university more than 2,000 years ago. Hey, do you think if we close our eyes, we can imagine what life was really like in ancient China? <laughs> Look at these clothes. Most excellent, madam. This is really pretty, but it's hard to move. I think I like my jeans. I guess I'm just an American girl. Yeah, no kidding. And I'm an American boy. <laughs> In China, the family is very important. The Chinese are especially proud of their family names. When they write their names, the family name comes first. This means the founder of the Han Dynasty, Liu Peng, belonged to the Liu family. My name is Corey Hawkins, but in China, I'd be called Hawkins Corey. It sounds funny, but not if you're Chinese. In ancient China, peasant farmers were highly respected. It was considered honorable work to make money from the land. Most people lived on a diet of beans, vegetables, and grains, including lots of rice. In northern China, farmers grew millet and wheat, which could be turned into noodles. Because China has few forests, cooks learn to build their fires with only a few twigs. They chop the meat and vegetables into little pieces to cook them really fast. That's how stir-fry was invented. Tea, or cha, has been the drink of China since the second century BC. It seems like everybody likes Chinese food. How many of you have been to China? Probably not many. I've only been there once myself. But even though China seems like a far off place, its influence is all around us. Hi, Steph. What you got? I've been researching kids in ancient China, so I got on my kite. Want to come fly it with me? You know, you're right. We do have the Chinese to thank for the kite, but what do you suppose they were doing with it way back then in 300 BC? I know I learned that today. The ancient Chinese invented the kite for military purposes, like measuring distances and signaling to other generals. Very good. Now, what about the paper it's made of? Where do you think that came from? Hey, I thought Egyptians invented paper. 
Well, you're close. The Egyptians did invent paper made from papyrus, which came from reeds. But the Chinese invented the kind of paper we use, made from trees. They invented mechanical printing, too. In fact, until the 18th century, nearly half the world's books were printed in Chinese. Whoa, and we couldn't read any of them. Well, maybe you could. There's some more ancient Chinese inventions right here in this trunk. Do you know what this is? A compass. Absolutely right. And this is China, of course. Of course. The Chinese were the first to develop fine porcelain. That's why we call it China. How about this stuff? Spaghetti in a trunk? Yeah, the Italians got spaghetti or noodles from the Chinese. But don't worry, it's not too messy in there. The Chinese didn't invent tomato sauce. And here are some inventions too big for this trunk. Oh, the wheelbarrow. That came from China? Yeah, and the ship's rudder, which made it possible to steer large ships for the first time. And do you know what this is? Is that acupuncture? Good one. This method of treating pain or illness by inserting little needles in the body goes back 2,000 years, and it gets more and more popular in our country every day. Here's one I know you like. Fireworks. Don't forget. The Chinese gave us gunpowder and firecrackers, too. What else you got in here? Oh, silk. I had a feeling that was Chinese. And I've got a great story for you about silk. Got a minute? Sure, this is cool. <laughs> It's hard to believe these beautiful silks come from worms, isn't it? But they do. More than 3,000 years ago, the Chinese discovered how to spin the cocoons of silkworms into cloth. Some of these patterns would have taken skilled embroiderers months to complete. They're so delicate that they look like floating mists. For many years, the Chinese controlled the silk trade. Everybody wanted the precious cloth, but only the Chinese had it. These extraordinary silks were found in the tomb of a very rich Chinese woman who died more than 2,000 years ago. Silk was often used as money in Lady Shin's time. So, what do you think about the Chinese? I think I know a lot more about them now than I did yesterday. Go have fun with your kite. Thanks. Bye. So the next time you fly a kite, or use a compass, or drink from a porcelain cup, think of China. <laughs>